So what is a snake bit franchise? It's a combination of bad luck, oh, bad decisions, he's an idiot. and bad timing all coming together at once. Richard, what are you doing? We had a trap play call, and it's a you comes up. You could sit here and say karma's a bitch. You're lucky. But some teams are just snake bit more than most. I think it's a team that gets close to the ultimate prize but can't close the deal. Didn't make it. He came up one yard short. Oh, boy. That's a snake bit franchise. Okay. And have yet. Have not yet. Ah, see. Told you it was going to happen. The number 10 snake bit franchise of all time. Buffalo Bills. Did you make this list? Somebody should. Whoever made this list should be fired. I mean, at least put him number one here. Because if you ask any Bills fan, nobody has been bitten more times and harder by that snake. They're killing me, right? They're killing me. Over the years, the Bills have been wounded in a lot of ways. The game is on the line. Do the Titans have a miracle left in them? not a miracle. It was a crime. It was a fraud perpetrated on the streets of Nashville. Who's number one? Who's number eight? Well, we go up to the show. What time? Next week. For every Bills fan, their greatest source of pride and pinpoint of pain is four straight Super Bowl appearances, four straight losses. We had not one, two, three, four bites of that apple and still didn't swallow it. All people who wanted in Buffalo just one, just once to say yes. High drama here in the Super Bowl. Scott Norwood. He can fire the shot heard round the world now. Any conversation about the Bill snake bit status begins with two simple words. Wide right, wide right, wide right, wide right. He has to the right with four seconds to play. There's no question about it in my mind. That's the game we definitely should have won. That started a, a bad streak for us. Against the Redskins, Hall of Fame running back Thurman Thomas was MIA at the kickoff when he lost his helmet. Kenneth Davis is in at running back, not Thurman Thomas. How do you lose your helmet during the Super Bowl? <laughs> an idiot. Oh, the Redskins have really dominated this game. They're just beating up the Bills. They got killed, basically, in the other three. I mean, 52-17, 30-13, the next year against the Cowboys. Kelly's going to throw here. Got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. And rolls in for a touchdown. So the Bills have had the wheels come off here. It was like a snowball effect. We couldn't stop the snowball from getting bigger. By the time the fourth one came around, you were like, oh, gosh, not again. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Deja vu. It was like a needle in the balloon. Here we go again. Just feel the balloon deflate. This has just been a horrible and horrendous nightmare for the Bills. When are the Buffalo Bills going to get out from this snake-bitten dark cloud that just sort of hangs around them? They can get so close, and then all of a sudden somebody snatches something away from them. The San Diego Chargers have been snake-bit by extreme temperatures, whether it was a hot quarterback in Super Bowl 29. Young goes deep middle, he's got Jerry Rice! Touchdown, 49 Or the cold Cincinnati temperatures in the 1981 AFC Championship. You can always look back at Cincinnati and go, what if, what if, what if? This is our day! The Chargers' day has yet to come. It was intercepted and then fumbled by San Diego. All the three has to do is just get down. San Diego didn't crack our list, but another Marty team with claim to playoff pain checks in at number nine. Number nine snake bit franchise of all time, the Kansas City Chiefs. Let's go, Chiefs! The first four Super Bowls, Kansas City was in two of them. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. Who would have ever thought that you wouldn't be back in the Super Bowl? Two years after winning Super Bowl IV, the Chiefs were again knocking on the door. They lose the longest game ever played at home. There's no reason we should have lost a football game. Oh, God! He missed it! Still hurts, <laughs> to tell you the truth. The god of football somewhere decided that they're just going to let Miami win that game. We just never seemed to get that swagger back after that loss. Well, how do we act on the days we don't play well? Following the loss, the Chiefs trudged through an over-two-decade run of irrelevance. 
Perhaps that was easier for fans than the pain experienced in the 90s. The 93 AFC Championship game, which would put us in the Super Bowl, we were playing in Buffalo. I remember a play right before halftime where Montana throws a pass. It was a pass to the fullback in the end zone that he dropped. And it's dropped and intercepted by the Bills! By halftime, Joe Montana has been hit and had a concussion, and he never comes back. I'm not so sure if Anders doesn't catch that ball that the Chiefs don't win that game. 1995, you have home field advantage. You have a very beatable, indoor, domed Colts team. You've got them outside. It's freezing, and you lose because of Lynn Elliott. It's wide left. The Colts are going to Pittsburgh. Our kicker missed three field goals, chip shot. The mighty Chiefs have fallen to the Colts. That snake broke me, Dave. you got to forget it. It broke my heart because we were a much better football team than they were. If you don't forget it, it'll, it'll gnaw at you. Two years later, again with the number one seed, again the better team, again a one-and-done run. So, pass is going to be knocked away! It's hard for me to talk about those years. They're kind of painful years. That's over. We can't do anything about it. I believe that Marty Schottenheimer had some kind of mental blocking when he was in the playoffs. Simple as that. You either get better or you get worse. You have to have a little luck along the way. And, you know, if it wasn't for bad luck, Marty wouldn't have any at all. You want a piece of that championship? Put it in here. Just the beginning. A new regime turned the Chiefs into an offensive powerhouse. In 2003, they started 9-0, but suffered yet another playoff disappointment to the Colts. And maybe that horseshoe that hangs on their helmet, we should put it on ours for some luck. Maybe we aren't as good as we thought we were. It is gut-wrenching for Chiefs Nation every year to see somebody else hand the Lamar Hunt trophy to another coach, to another team. For God's sake, it's, it's about our turn. I don't know if I particularly believe in, in karma, but there just seems like there's a kind of a bad karma around this organization. The number eight snake bit franchise of all time, the New York Jets. When I was a kid, I was into the Jets, and then I got into girls as I got older. And then I got back into the Jets because I realized there's times when a girl won't f you, but the Jets will always f you. You cannot find a more star-crossed franchise. Testa Verde down on the deck, and he is in a lot of pain. All these years without even getting a taste of the Super Bowl. I don't have the Jets at number eight. I'd love to see your top seven. I know the Jets went the one and won it. It's 40 years ago. 40. The New York Jets are the world champions in a stunning upset. They had one of the great wins of all time. And I think they're still paying for it. Joe Namath had a conversation with the Devil right before that Super Bowl, and he said, Devil, if you give me this championship, you don't have to give the Jets anything else for the rest of my life. Marino takes the snap from center. They caught the Jets off guard on that play. The rest of the world is Lucy to the Jets' Charlie Brown. Here's another penalty marker down. They might have Gaffin on a late hit. The game was over if we hadn't had that. Truly believed it. Thank goodness for Mark Gaston, though, the 12th man for the Cleveland Browns, late in the fourth quarter. Snap and set down, and the game is history. That, to me, was the worst loss in the history of the franchise until 2004 in Pittsburgh. Doug Bryant from 43 yards away to send the Jets to the AFC Championship game. Here's the snap, it's down, the kick by Bryant. It's no good. It usually happens wrong when it comes to one play for this team. They've had a plethora of hideous coaches, you know, from Lou Holtz, you know, to Bruce Coslett. I can't believe we blew that play. No success without Grow. What a mess. Pete Carroll was here for one year. Richie Kotite. This is serious business. Rich Kotite, he looked like he should be like a, a plumber's assistant or something, and he's the head coach of the Jets. You would have thought if there was one coach who could end the years of misery and the torment, it would have been Bill Parcells. It's about competition here, son. Even the great Bill Parcells couldn't escape the Jets' karma on the final weekend of the 1997 season. 
here the Jets are. They have a chance to get in the playoffs. Bill Parcells, arguably one of his greatest coaching jobs ever. And then in a final game against the Lions, he just makes some of the most asinine decisions you could ever imagine. They're going to run it. That could be an option pass here. Leon Johnson throws. And it is intercepted. It was like Parcells had just morphed into Rich Kotite for that one day. Parcells lasted three years on the job, and his early departure caused another snake bite for our number 18. Um, I've decided to resign as the head coach of the New York Jets. Belichick leaving them at the altar has got to be the ultimate punch to the stomach for Jets fans. He's the head coach for 32 minutes and goes on to become the greatest coach in modern football. It's another reason why the Jets have to be higher than eighth on the all-time most snake-bitten franchise. They have to be. Even in the 2008 season, when I look at what they had, Brett Favre, it looked like they were on their way to the playoffs. The Jets are starting to look like a team that could be AFC contenders. They could be Super Bowl contenders. All the New York papers, everybody's like, the Jets are going to the Super Bowl. Next thing you know, the team falls apart. Then the last game of the year, Chad Pennington going back into the Meadowlands and beating Brett Favre. For some reason, we can't get over that hump and get back to where uh, Joe Namath created 40 years ago. You know, right now we're kind of snake bit, so hopefully we can find some antibiotics for that venom. I am prepared to live out my remaining days on this planet without seeing the Jets win the Super Bowl. I've come to terms with that. Seeking is a Super Bowl. The Rams won a Super Bowl in St. Louis, but in Los Angeles, they were snake bit by some of the greatest teams ever. It was as if the tape had been abruptly moved, just out of reach. The fearsome foursome was derailed by the 67 Packers. The 70s teams ran into the Vikings and Cowboys in four conference championship losses. Hey, we're about that far away from everything. And in the 80s, the Rams lost NFC Championship games to the 85 Bears and the 89 49ers. Now they own this ball game right now. Yes, the Rams are just almost competing physically. The lone time they did reach the Super Bowl, the steel curtain dropped on another sad ending. Would I be dressed like this if there was a doubt in my mind as to who was going to win? While the Rams had their day in the Super Bowl sun, our number 17 was cursed by a dark, endless storm. The number seven snake bit franchise of all time, the Detroit Lions. It's too low. This might be the most snake bitten franchise in professional sports. Tell me six more franchises that are more snake bit than Detroit. The Lions' wounds are still fresh, even after half a century. Bobby Lane makes like a burger as he sneaks through the 49ers for a touchdown. In 1957, Detroit ruled the NFL as champions. But when the team traded their charismatic quarterback, Bobby Lane, he put a curse on the franchise. There's so many freaking curses around here. Why not throw Bobby into it? What is it? Lane said the Lions would never win for the next 50 years. There's a curse of Bobby Lane. When they traded him, they have not been the same since. Matter of fact, they have not been a franchise since then. You want to believe there is something larger at play than just 50 years of mistakes and incompetence and bizarre injuries. The only thing the Lions fans can hope for now is they've gone as low as you can absolutely go, and the only way is up. I mean, I think this should be the number one team. When you look at their history, one playoff win in the last 50-plus years, they have just been dreadful. Not even Barry Sanders, the only superstar capable of cracking the curse, could pull Detroit out of the playoff snick pit. Maybe the Waterloo of Barry Sanders' the Lion was in Green Bay in the 1994 playoffs where he ran the ball 12 times from minus one yard. This is arguably the greatest running back that you ever saw in the NFL. The next season, Pro Bowl tackle Lomas Brown tried to cancel the curse by guaranteeing a victory. It was over pretty much in the second quarter. And they're down 51-7 to to the Eagles and just absolutely get embarrassed. Lay a complete egg. Scott Mitchell, there's an ad verb adjective now called Mitchelling. Well, he Mitchell. Four interceptions, could hit the ground with the ball. Munson made the comedy complete by throwing still another interception, the fourth in five consecutive pass plays. It's easy to believe in this curse because the position that has been most cursed on the Lions since Bobby Lane left is the quarterback position. How do you run three yards out of the end zone like that and not even know? 
The quarterback battles that have taken place. Eric Kramer, Andre Ware, Rodney Pete. Rodney Pete is the guy we're going to ride. We're going to put a saddle on him. And the team's going to follow Rodney all the way to the end of the season. Andre Ware will, will be started. I'm hoping that this guy will take us through this whole season. Joey Harrington, do I need to revisit that? Who's a train wreck from the beginning? Early in the 2008 season, the 50-year curse of Bobby Lane was set to expire. Oh, that could have up. Good for us. Well, not exactly. The Lions went on to become the only NFL team to go winless in a 16-game season. By record, they are the worst team in league history. See, I think that was just a perfect bookend for the curse. The 50th year of the curse of Bobby Lane. They don't win. Instead, they put up the worst season in the history of the NFL. The number six snake bit franchise of all time. The New Orleans Saints. It might be another pack with the devil for what the city is, but I'll tell you that the New Orleans Saints, for me, are as snake bit a franchise as any in the history of the NFL. In 1967, the Saints came roaring in like a lion, scoring on their inaugural kickoff. But they soon became a sacrificial lamb without a winning season in their first 20 years. They reached the abyss of, of, of horrible football. The Saints were considered for a long time to be a lost cause, and New Orleans loves lost causes. As an expansion team, the Saints began with a snake bit squad, cast offs. And I just think when I broke. They were all at the downside of their career, and they were just playing out the string and a really cool town to play it out in. The French Quarter was, in fact, the other locker room for the New Orleans Saints. They would always say they won the fifth quarter, and the fifth quarter was in the French Quarter. They, they'd win that game. Stuck in the eye of the snake-bit storm was Archie Manning, the Saints' lone superstar, who got the hell beat out of him. Manning's motley supporting cast included an astronaut as GM, seven different head coaches, and a mascot named Gumbo. It was very appropriate that it would be a St. Bernard because he had some whiskey hanging off the front that people would probably take a hit of during the course of the game. There's some crazy people that play this game. And our dressing room always looked like a train station. I mean, with bags going and coming. And in the huddle with a receiver, you've never even thrown a pass to. I mean, it's... It's goofy stuff. Nothing was goofier than the 1980 season. An 0-14 start gave birth to a national institution, the bag-headed Aints. There is one of the Aints. They don't want anyone to know they're identified with their football team. Yeah, we're getting very elaborate, our sack folks. That's how we feel. To end the misery, championship coaches were brought in. We'll do it. Have a little fight. But only after their competitive fires had burned out. Dick had arrived here. The best way I can describe him, he was still sitting in the back of the limousine waving at people after that Super Bowl 11 years before. Mike Ditka was a disappointment. Did not do a good job drafting and coaching. It's like having open heart surgery week after week after week without any anesthetic. In 1999, Ditka gave up an entire year of draft picks for Ricky Williams. A marriage that was snake bit from the start. Really, what made the Saints a laughing stock? That trade set back the franchise, I think, about five years. In America's voodoo capital, the Saints' snake bitten curse was broken in 2009. Super Bowl may have exercised the demons, but it doesn't erase three-plus decades of disappointments, a history depressing enough to earn them the sixth spot on our list. And now, the number five statement franchise of all time, the Houston Oilers. We're going out there this, this first half, and we're going to explode like a bomb. In my definition of snakebite, which is just bad luck, I mean, I put the Houston Oilers right there. That's Buddy Ryan taking a swing at Kevin Gilbride. There was somebody out there, always, that was a little bit bigger and a little bit better and a little bit better than they were. A great example of the Oilers being snake bit was in 1979. For the second year in a row, they may have been the second best team in the NFL, but it was their misfortune to go against the greatest dynasty, Steel Kurt. It is Renfro, touchdown, or is it? It's a play that uh, goes down as, you know, 
probably the biggest play in Houston order history. The official did not make any signal, and now apparently has said no touchdown. He's in! He's in! He was in! It was a play that could have got us with the correct call. It could have got us to the Super Bowl. It's, it's a pretty tough pill to swallow. And how very big that play in the end zone has turned out to be. The Oilers are that close, I mean literally that close, to interrupting the dynasty of the Pittsburgh Steelers. We really think deep down inside we felt like we were robbed. Son of a gun, we can't catch a stinking break. We gotta have the worst luck in the National Football League. The Houston Oilers were contenders again in the late 80s. But seven straight playoff appearances yielded nary a trip to the conference championship. Don't get discouraged, just keep working. And they were snake bit by three straight late game collapses. In all three games, their defense cost them those victories. Ball is down, up, and it is gone. You gotta be ready, you gotta know you're ready. That team gave up a 35 to 3 lead at halftime. And of all the losses in Oiler history, this has got to rank as the most devastating. We're a team of destiny. We're going to take this thing. 1993, they build a lead in the Astrodome before the biggest Astrodome crowd in history. So what happens? The victim of Joe Montana's last miracle when he threw a pass to Willie Davis that was a dagger through the collective hearts of Houston. And I say to this day, that pass in that game contributed to the Oilers leaving town and moving to Tennessee. The Oilers left town in 1996, and they took their bad karma with them. Teams that move seem to have some bad juju. He came up one yard short. One yard short. And you look at the Tennessee Titans where they were this close to winning the Super Bowl. One yard short. It's a game of inches. <laughs> you talk about it. Yeah, it's a game of inches. It's just almost as if it was carrying over from Texas over to Tennessee. Maybe this franchise has never, ever meant to win anything of significance. The road to the Super Bowl comes through here. You know, I know they're fifth on your list. To me, they would be higher. Never give up, baby. Never give up. The number four snake bit franchise of all time, the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles are the best example of a situation where it's better to never even contend than to contend all the time, get close, and have your heart broken. Many dreams may have crushed. To this day, I can't believe they lost to Tampa. Well, the Eagles had beaten 500 straight times, and Tampa Bay had never won in under 40 degrees, and they were coming to the vet where there wasn't a prayer they could win, and it was cold. And then what happened? The Eagles fell apart. Big snap back, fires, and it's intercepted! You get a Super Bowl in Tampa before we get one in Philadelphia? Really? This is, this is what the gods have decided. For the third year in a row, the Eagles reaching the conference championship game and going no further. I still think that they're better than the Bucks. I think they were better than the Panthers. You know, and I, and I think they were better than the Arizona Cardinals. You know what we're doing now, third time the chomp. Eagles are, are one and four in NFC championships. So they're like a lamer version of the Buffalo Bills. Like that's your legacy. Congrats. The Eagles have tormented fans of all generations. The Gang Green Eagles had a five-year snake bit run that started with the Fog Bowl. Boy, was that a fun game. It was it was like staring at, you know, the side of a ship. The Eagles and the Bears are playing football, but I can't see, nor can anyone else. We in Philadelphia were screaming at the top of our lungs, stop the game. I believe the Bears would have lost had the fog not rolled in. The Eagles that year would have won the Super Bowl if they get out of Chicago. Three years later, their Super Bowl hopes again went up in smoke, this time in week one. Randall Cunningham, who's a potential league MVP, walks into the season with a historically great defense. Randall Cunningham is down on the field. Talk about Mike Bears. When Bryce Pop hit his knee, the world of Philadelphia football crumbled that year. I hate Bryce Pop to this day. That season was the season that was supposed to deliver a Super Bowl to Philadelphia. I hope Bryce Pop is like working at a Walmart somewhere. And then, of course, Jerome dies that spring. And it basically sunk the 92 season. 
I don't want to say that they couldn't continue on after him, but there was a void that the Eagles never came close to filling because of Jerome Brown. Some of us wondered if the vet had been built over an old Indian burial ground because it seemed nothing right went on there. Regardless of the playing arena, not much has gone right for our number four snake bit team since winning a championship in 1960. They have even lost by winning, as witnessed in 1968. There's actually a reward for being bad, and that was the first pick in the draft, who that year was O.J. Simpson. They get to 0-11. They actually win two in a row. The Buffalo Bills selected their first choice, first round, Halfback O.J. Simpson, University of Southern California. O.J. goes to Buffalo. The Eagles get Leroy Keyes, and the Philadelphia snake bite continues. I think we even revel in our frustration that the championship hasn't come our way. This, the city and the town and that team is snake bit. Can you have a top ten list and not include the Atlanta Falcons? You look at the Falcons' history, it's been so frustrating. You had that moment where they had the Dallas Cowboys beat. It was a done deal. They're going to the next level. Then out of nowhere. Into the end zone. Touchdown! Too legit to quit. Falcon time. Then you had this moment of hope with Deion Sanders coming up here. Deion, 100 yards! Get in the playoffs and... Falcons have given them the ball. You do that and you will get hammered in the head. So the Dirty Bird's all about. Here we go. Now it's 1998. You've got this Dirty Bird thing going. you got this magic. you got Dan Reeves coming back from a heart attack. You get to the Super Bowl. <sighs> Nothing. Super Bowl 33 is history. The Denver Broncos have beaten the Atlanta Falcons 34 to 19. This is a sign of a totally snake-bitten franchise. Our number three franchise had its Super Bowl dreams shattered by one of their own former coaches. The number three snake-bit franchise of all time, the Cincinnati Bengals. Why so low? They can't be that bad if they've been to the Super Bowl twice. And their founder, Paul Brown, the Hall of Famer. Paul Brown was the father of modern coaching. In Cincinnati, he mentored Bill Walsh. But in choosing a successor, Brown set the Bengals on their snake-bit path. My former team, Cincinnati Bengals, probably do deserve to be on that list. They passed on a great coach in Bill Walsh. Paul thought Bill Walsh was crazy. He didn't trust him. Holy smoke, Bill. He didn't like some of the things that we were trying to do. So you're here, you're here. If you hired Bill Walsh, we were going to be the West Coast offense on the Ohio River. Yeah, you know, they had the coach that went on and built the system that beat them in two Super Bowls right there in their midst, and they chose not to hand him the chalk. Brown hired Bill Tiger Johnson instead, who resigned in the middle of his third season. What if Bill Walsh stays and Bob Trump, he'll probably tell you this, his hands would be decorated with Super Bowl rings. Super Bowl 16. Here's Anderson back pedaling. Throws a pass over the middle. And it's Anderson by one. 81 hurts the most. They couldn't get out of their own way with fumbles, with the inability to score at the goal line. Paul in signals on fourth down. Has the ball. Hands it off. He's been at the goal line. I don't believe he got in have an opportunity to play in the biggest game of your life and you don't play as well as you can play it haunts you forever the rematch came eight seasons later but the Bengals were snake bit even before kickoff there's a major story breaking out of the bengal camp and it isn't good stanley wilson who has twice before been suspended because of involvement with drugs the bengal running back suspended on the eve of the super bowl i went back into the room and i said men stanley wilson won't be playing tomorrow I can remember guys taking their playbook and slamming them on the ground. Didn't mean enough to him to make the right choice. Here was your fullback, critical member of the team. It was devastating to this franchise. And then they have a Tim Crumry get hurt so early in the game. The heart and soul of that defense. Crumry going across. Watch the leg. Oh, that is. Ooh, and look at the foot. Ah. Ooh. With only seconds to play, Bill Walsh and Joe Montana came back to bite the Bengals one more time. Montana's going to go back and throw. Into the end zone. Touchdown to Painter. This is our deja vu. I'm still pissed off. It's a parallel. The death of Paul Brown and the demise of the franchise in the 90s were simultaneous. I, I called it the lost decade. Searching for a quarterback to recapture the Super Bowl magic, the Bengals suffered a string of first-round washouts. The team was labeled the Bungles. 
You can't miss at that position. You can't miss at the primary position in football. Achilles Smith, he couldn't play, couldn't think football at an NFL level. Other players went on to implode and implode their franchise right along with them. This ain't the same old Bengals. This is the new Bengals. Even when Cincinnati drafted a franchise quarterback, he was bitten in only the second snap of his first playoff game. Carson Palmer is down. Timo Bonohoffen put the hit on Carson Palmer. When Palmer went down, you could positively feel an entire town just kind of sag. The Bengals fans are probably the most long-suffering fans in the NFL. They've had to endure more. You have to say that the Cincinnati Bengals are a snake-bitten franchise. And not include the Arizona Cardinals, a team that went 62 years without a home playoff game. Super Bowl three. One, two, three. Super Bowl After decades of failure, the Cardinals finally made it to the Super Bowl, only to be stung by the Steelers in the final second. Santonio with a touchdown! Man, oh man, that close for the Arizona Cardinals in their first Super Bowl. The Seahawks were also mired in mediocrity before they got their first championship shot, also against Pittsburgh. But Seattle couldn't catch a break from the black and white Seabirds. Touchdown, Seahawks! That's interference. Ooh, that was a ticky-tacky call. I felt like that game more than any other. The officials determine the outcome of the game. Oh, my goodness, it's coming back. I don't know how you call that. Hold it, hold it. Are saying this? Picking our number two ranked franchise was a much easier call. The number two snake bit franchise of all time, the Minnesota Vikings. I think two is a perfect spot. They've been to those Super Bowls. They haven't been able to close the deal. How could there be shame in losing the Super Bowl? It's not a snake bit franchise at all. Being 0-4 in the Super Bowl, that's, that's about as snake bit as you can get. Starting in the late 60s, the Vikings dominated the NFC, winning their division nine out of ten years. It was a legendary squad loaded with Hall of Famers. Fred Tarkenton, the Purple People Eaters, you got Bud Red on the sidelines. You can't win a Super Bowl? It was like the team that Bud Grant coached from September to December just didn't bother to show up. How can you not want to win every game to the fullest? Does Tiger Woods play golf harder on the fourth day than he does the first day of a tournament? No! No! I'm going to win this game. We're going to make these guys wish to never come off the reservation. That's telling them. They're not ready for that quick count. They were an outmaneuvered in the one against Kansas City because they weren't ready for what they saw. Yeah, the sulky was running around there like it was a Chinese fire drill. You know, Hank Stram's laughing at him on the sidelines. <laughs> it's like stealing. It's like stealing. See, that's like stealing over there. Lost to the great Dolphin team. It was coming off the perfect season, going for two in a row. And Larry Zonka running over like, like ten guys. Something went crazy for that Vikings team when the time came to play in the game that really mattered. In Pittsburgh, we had a fumble recovery, we were offside. We had an interception, defensive hold. That's been snake bet. Felt like, you know, here it goes again. They caught a Raider team that was just massive in its offensive line. We took purple people leaders and uh, put them on a diet. <laughs> Winning isn't everything, but losing sure is nothing. You lose something like that as a real nothing feeling. Still haunts me every day. When you start talking about snake-bit franchises, particularly ones that have had the talent to do well, Minnesota is clearly number one. In 1987, a trip to the Super Bowl was just across the goal line. Fourth down and four. Look at left. In a 1975 playoff, the Vikings were cursed by a Cowboys prayer. The Hail Mary game, that team was snake bit. That was the team they felt that gave them the best shot to win the Super Bowl. There was no way we can lose that game. No way in the world. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. But sometimes the gods just say, you know, I want this one to win rather than this one. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown. What you believe it? And it also got a terrible call from an official. Drew Pearson pushes Nate Wright. Everybody knows it. And Drew Pearson told me that eye to eye and said, but I'll deny it, Lurtz. It was just that sudden, that shocking, like the world stopped. 
1998, Minnesota fielded one of the greatest offenses in football history. When you think about the 15-1 and one year, the year when they set the record for most points scored, you know, Randy Moss was just an unstoppable player. And Randall Cunningham is resurrected, and it seems like this is the unstoppable team. First down! He's done it all year long. He hasn't missed an extra point or a field goal. He'll go with it. He makes this. Game is over. 39-yard attempt. The spot, the kick by Anderson on the way, it's no good. Oh, Gary Anderson has missed a field goal for the first time in two years. Unbelievable. Absolutely one of the most devastating sports moments in the history of Minnesota. Walking off that field, I didn't know if I wanted to play football anymore. I felt like that I would never win after that. The number one state bid franchise of all time. The Cleveland Browns. We're number one. Number one. Number one Browns, baby! <laughs> number one! They're number one in something, finally. If you go back 60 years, the Browns were number one in football. Back then, the Browns were the model franchise. Everybody wanted to be like the Browns. It started turning wrong, really, when they fired Paul Brown. The Browns of the late 70s were mediocre. The Browns of the 80s were snake bit. play was Red Right 88. It's a famous play in Cleveland Moore. The game was won. The only thing Sam Ritigliano's got to do is kick the field goal. No. I'm sitting here looking at the game, and I'm saying, be careful with it, Brian. Be careful with it. End zone, Newsom. Oh, it's intercepted. It's intercepted, and that does it. Bad karma started right from that moment. Right on down the line, bad things stay with the Browns to this day. We just need to flush it all out. It makes you think about games like the drive and the fumble, things where it could have been, but it wasn't. The look, the throw, touchdown! 98 yards, the drive. 98 yards in your own stadium and your fans going crazy. They had success right there, this close, and they couldn't seal the deal. Right now, it's time to take a step forward. The corner, of the three, to the two. He's almost the football, and the it. A play like that can really make a, a franchise and a city feel as if the stars are not aligned properly for them. You owe us one now, damn it, let go! To be that close... You know, I, I, I still to this day get emotional. I should mature. I should grow up. I should get over it. I haven't either. After all of those, then you had the move. The Browns are indeed coming to Baltimore. Who'd ever thunk that the Cleveland Browns would leave Cleveland? The Cleveland Browns, they don't move. I mean, they're old school NFL. They don't move. And then to see Art Modell and that team win a Super Bowl five years later was very, very hard for a lot of Browns fans to take. I can't tell you how proud I am of this organization. All they had to do was get the stench of Cleveland out of their nostrils, and boom, they're champions. Says a lot about the football curse that that city lives under. It's Cleveland Brown time, not the old Browns, the new Browns. One franchise leaves and goes somewhere else, a new one comes in, and they still have strangeness. Oh, this is terrible. They're getting pelted. They're not doing so well in the second version, are they? Dwayne Rudd took his helmet off and threw it when he thought the game was over. The new Browns finally made the playoffs in 2002 but looked an awful lot like the old Browns. They're leading Pittsburgh late in the, the second half. We'll be an opener next week, baby. The last 19 minutes of that game were torture for Browns fans. I had every confidence, not that the Steelers would win it, but that the Browns would blow it. They always blow it. And time ran out. And maybe they shouldn't have built the, the new stadium where the old stadium stood. They're still the Browns. It don't matter. We just can't get a break. And, of course, then the media always comes out and says, hey, do you guys know it's been 64 since you won a championship? Yeah, thanks for reminding us. One day, it's all going to come together, and we're going to have our day in the big show. We can't win for losing. <laughs> Every team on our list figures their day will eventually come, but until it does, these teams will remain snake bit. 
a tease to their fans' hopes and dreams.